I feel like I'm going to be repeating a certain idea a lot through this video. This is going to be a long video. Buckle in, grab some popcorn, settle down, and get ready to hear the word of God. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I am sure those verses will come up again in the future of this video. By the title of this video, I am pretty sure I know where it is going. You missed the turn. You idiot. Shut up, Hazel. How dare you tell me to shut up? That's emotional abuse, Henry. Don't start that again. Marrying you was the biggest mistake of my life. You male chauvinist pig. Zip it so I can think. Henry, look out. <laughs> what did he say? He said, get a priest. So if you don't know what he's asking about when he asks for a priest, he's asking for that priest to admission or give him his last rites. Now, this is what the Catholic, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says about uh, last rites. It says, Like all the sacraments, the anointing of the sick is a liturgical and communal celebration, whether it takes place in the family home, a hospital, or church for a single sick person or a whole group of sick persons. It is very fitting to celebrate it within the Eucharist, the memorial of the Lord's Passover. If circumstances suggest it, the celebration of this sacrament can be preceded by the sacrament of penance and followed by the sacrament of the Eucharist. As the sacrament of Christ's Passover, the Eucharist should always be the last sacrament of the earthly journey, the vacuum or passing over to eternal life. So that's what he means when he's asking for a priest, he's asking for his last rites. Did he make a good confession? Father? Yes, thank God. He'll be dead in an hour. Since he got his last rites, John's okay, right Father? Yes, I have forgiven all his sins. John Sullivan was the most devout layman in our parish. The dear man even had an audience with the Pope. What a terrible loss. John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23. It says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were, the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. In this passage, Jesus gives his disciples the power to forgive sins. If you notice, he says, you forgive and you retain, meaning that he gives them the power to forgive sins, allowing them to continue his work on earth. One thing to note is that the priest is not acting on his own power. The priest is acting on the power given to him by Jesus, and he is only acting in the place of Jesus. The priest, through the power of the Holy Spirit, stands in place of Christ through Christ's power to forgive the sinner's sins. You're going to face the Lord, John. I hope I've been good enough to make it. That was your big mistake. That doesn't make sense. He says, I hope I've been good enough to make it. And then the angel replies, that was your big mistake. So is his mistake being good? Because I thought you had to live a good life to get into heaven. But at least it's starting to get interesting. All his life, John Sullivan faithfully served Holy Mother, the Church. The Catholic Church is the Bride of Christ, making it the mother to its members. It dispenses the grace Christ won to its members and rears those members in the Christian life and helps lead them in a Christian life. Where I got that will be in the description. After a stay in purgatory, our beloved John will enjoy the bliss of heaven, thanks to all the prayers and masses said for him. I have never heard a priest say now he's in purgatory. Um, I've never really heard somebody say 
Now he's in purgatory, he's gonna go to heaven afterwards. I've never heard the concept of, like, oh, he's going to purgatory. Like, I've heard, like, oh, he's in a better place now, but I've never heard purgatory. I think I'm digging too deep into this. Probably am. But John's name wasn't in the book of life, so he heard these terrible words. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's because he's Catholic, isn't he? No, wait. You can't do this. It's unfair. Please, Lord, listen to all the wonderful things I did. Speak, John, I am listening. I spent my whole life doing good works. My word says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As always, I have two articles in the description. Please go and uh, check them out. Okay, you used Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. And that is, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, least any man should boast. Now, you need to go back really quickly, verses 4 through 6, which says, by God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which we, he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up with him. St. Paul is talking about how the initial grace of salvation or justification is completely and utterly unmerited. The Catholic Church teaches this in agreement with Scripture. Another way the Church teaches this truth is that you were baptized. For Pete's sake, how could a baby do anything to merit salvation? In Philippines chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So once you or a baby grows up and reaches the age of accountability, you must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Or as St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the very next phrase after Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. St. Paul was in no way ruling out works as being necessary for salvation. He was simply teaching what the Catholic Church has taught for its entire existence, which is 2,000 years. All he was saying is that no one can justify what they do before entering into Christ. But once they enter into Christ, it's a whole new ballgame. It's something new. It's completely different. One more thing is James chapter 2, verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. This is as plain as anything that says both faith alone is insignificant for our justification and that works are indeed necessary. Are we justified by faith? Certainly. By faith alone? No way. It's both faith and works, according to scripture. Jesus says it similarly. John chapter 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And are we saved by faith alone? No way. As you saw in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 19, Jesus himself said to a rich young man who had asked him what he needed to have eternal life, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 through 37, Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will render account for every careless word they utter. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Sounds like there's a lot more to this justification thing than faith alone. I took a lot of this from Catholic Answers, so go check them out. Links will be in the description. They might be a lot more understandable, and they go into greater detail. But I prayed to the Blessed Virgin, just like the Pope does. That's idolatry, John, and no idolater shall enter heaven. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. 
We don't worship Mary. We venerate Mary, and this is a common misconception about the Catholic Church. If you don't know what I mean when, we, when I say we venerate Mary, it means we regard her with great respect. Catholics believe God and God alone is the only one worthy of worship. Though, when we pray to her, we don't pray to her because we believe she has the power to change things. No, we believe only God can change things. But we pray to her because we believe that she can pray for us too, just like when we pray to the saints. We don't believe they can change anything. Only God can change things. Though we do believe that the saints and Mary can pray for us, Mary is a role model and should be a role model for every Christian for her trust and her faith in God. Remember, an angel appeared to her. And she said that you will bear Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And she was scared. She had, an angel just suddenly appeared and she didn't know. She didn't know what was going to happen to her. But she trusted in God and she said yes. Every Christian should want to emulate Mary's devotion to Christ. Catholics Come Home says this very well. Open quotes. Mary is the most beautiful model of total submission to the will of God. Catholics do not view Mary as equal to Christ, but rather venerate Mary because of her relationship to Christ. The Catechism of the Catholic Church explains, Mary's role in the Church is inseparable from her union with Christ and flows directly from it. As Catholics, we pray that we can respond to God's call to holiness for our lives in the way that Mary did. Close quotes. Now I'll have that website down in the description. If you take anything away from this, take away this. Catholics believe that worship is owed to God alone. Catholics only venerate Mary. We only honor and respect Mary. Oh Lord, I'm sick. Maybe this will help. I was an altar boy and attended Mass twice a week. John, where do you find the Mass in Scripture? It doesn't exist. What are you talking about? The Mass is very biblical. You can find and trace everything back to the Bible in the Mass, as you see as I am showing you. I found this on Catholic Answers Forum, which as always will be in the description. I'm sure you can find more examples of things in the Mass being traced back to the Bible. If you wish to read what's on screen, you can pause the video or you can go to the website that is in the description. Though just take away that the Mass is biblical. But Lord, the Mass is the unbloody, ongoing sacrifice at Calvary. That's a lie. The sacrifice was completed on the cross when I cried, it is finished. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So I was looking around and I was thinking, what's a good answer to this that people will understand when I talk about it? And I remember I owned a book called Theology for Beginners by Frank Sheed, and I highly recommend it. Go check it out. And his answer was in 18, um, the sacrifice of the Mass, because I feel like in this segment he's mainly talking about the Eucharist. So the answer comes from the book Fulton J. Sheed. Now I'm going to summarize it, but the answer and the idea I got from the book Theology for Beginners, so go check it out. Link to the book will be in the description below. Upon the cross at Calvary, Jesus offered himself up as a perfect sacrifice for the redemption of the human race. Mm -hmm. There had been sacrifices before Jesus' sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. These sacrifices were mere shadows or foretellings of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Though none had reached the perfection that Jesus' death on the cross at Calvary did, Jesus accomplished three things. Jesus atoned for our sins. He closed the gap between humans and God. He opened the gates of heaven to us, never to be closed again. What Jesus did on the cross was completion. It was done once and for all, never to be completed again. Though with such completion, what was still to be done? Christ still works on our behalf. As Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 puts it, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Or Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We are not adding to Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary, we are simply adding an application to what happened on Calvary to every man.
We do this so that every man can receive what Jesus won for us at his sacrifice on Calvary. We are showing to God the sacrifice of Calvary. It is not a new sacrifice. Jesus, the victim, now deathless, stands before God with the marks of his sacrifice still upon him. In Revelations chapter 5, verse 6, it says, A lamb standing as if it were slain. Now we are in a better position to understand the sacrifice of the Mass. Christ in heaven is pre presenting himself before his heavenly Father, once slain upon the cross at Calvary. Through Christ's command, through Christ's power, and in Christ's name, the priest on earth is offering up the victim once slain on Calvary. This is the sacrifice at Calvary presented anew, so that the sacrifice one for our race may be presented to us individually so that its fruits may grow in us individually. The priest consecrates the bread and the wine, truly making it Christ's body and blood. This meaning that the Christ he offers is really and truly there. The church sees a separate consecration as being part of the very essence of the Mass. We are told to show forth Christ's death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, it says, they should show forth the death of the Lord until he come. This means we should be reminded of his death, not of course kill him any more than he had killed himself on Calvary. We are not merely spectators of the Mass, for we too, along with the priest, are offering up this sacrifice. We, united with the priest, offer up Christ to God. Though God gives him back to us, to be the life of our life, this is what Holy Communion means. Open quotes, God, while retaining Christ for his own, also shares him with us, so that God and man, each in his own way, receive the slain and risen God slash man. Thank you. I try not to copy that word for word, but in some points I did. So to make me not feel so bad, could y'all go check out the book in the description? A link to it will be in the description, so go check it out. It is not just filled about the communion, but it's filled with sin, redemption, grace, Christ's death, the resurrection. It talks about Mary, the Holy Spirit, the sacraments, baptism, the second coming. So please, it's a great book. Go check it out. It's by Frank Sheed uh, called Theology for Beginners. Then again, a link to it will be in the description. But Lord, I know my baptism cleansed me of original sin. Right? Wrong, John. Only the blood I shed on Calvary can cleanse sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. But I thought being baptized as a baby made me a Christian. I never said that. You should have believed my word, instead of your catechism. They lied about that, too. Are you denying baptism? Now, baptism is a thing that can be talked for hours and hours, and if you wish to learn more, as always, there will be links in the, the description. Because Jesus himself says you need to be baptized. John chapter 3 verse 5. Jesus answered truly, truly unless one is baptized by water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 through 41. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all that are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from, his crooked gener from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 21. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but may be made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism, as long as any other thing we talk about, can't just be talked about for like five seconds. There's a lot of theology and a lot of thinking and a lot that goes into every sacrament, as there is a lot that goes into religion. 
Though, if you do wish to learn more about the Catholic position on baptism, again, the things will be in the description to read and watch. But Lord, I confessed my sins to Father Damien, and he forgave me. He couldn't do that, John. No man has the power to forgive sins. I am the only one who can forgive sins. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins, but God only? Then millions of Catholics have been deceived. This is horrible news, God. Why didn't you warn me? You are absolutely right. Only God can forgive sins. John chapter 20 verse 19 through 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the, the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Mm -hmm. Jesus gave the apostles the ability to forgive sins so that they may carry on his work that he started on earth. Remember, he says you forgive and you retain. It does not say you proclaim forgiveness or you proclaim them retained. A common misconception is that the priest is forgiving the sins on his own power, which is not true. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the priest acting on Christ's behalf, through the power of Christ, forgives the sin and declare the sinner forgiven. This is why absolution uses the pronoun the, because it's Christ speaking through the priest. Now, if Jesus had not come to earth, there would be no forgiveness of sins on earth. And if he had not given the apostles the ministry of reconciliation or conferred the ministry, we would not have it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Now all the things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Though Christ did come to earth, and he did pass on the authority to forgive sins to the church. If I confused you, as always, there will be links in the description talking about this more. I did. My servant, who loved Roman Catholics, gave you a tract that warned you about your false religion. I wanted you to know that your sins could be forgiven and you could be assured of heaven. This is hate literature. How dare you attack my church? But those are God's words. Baloney. I believe my priest, not this junk. I honestly don't have much to say about this segment, not much to say. You just made it seem like Catholics don't believe the word of God in that segment, which we do. Everything we do can be traced back to scripture. Well, on with the rest of the video. Here's what that track would have told you, John. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Rome says, this is the sin of presumption, because she wants to keep you serving the church, and trusting her for your salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Are you saved? asked the fundamentalist. The Catholic replied, as the Bible says, I am already saved, but I am also being saved. And I will, and I have the hope that I will be saved. Like the Apostle Paul, I am working out my salvation in fear and trembling, with hopeful confidence in the promise of Christ. The full article is in the description. I was upset, Lord. The track attacked the one true church. Don't you love the Roman Catholic Church? How could I, John? Her false teachings are why you are going into the lake of fire. That's not right at all. Jesus loves everyone, no matter who you are, whether you're the lowest sinner or the highest saint. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God commendeth his love towards us, and that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ just didn't die for you, or he didn't just die for one group of people. He died for everyone and all their sins. He died for your sins, for my sins. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 17. Or John chapter 15 verse 9 through 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
Yes, Jesus does love us Catholics. This video has been made full of lies and deceit about our faith. Though I'll let this video carry on, I will state Jesus does love everyone. That's why I warned precious Catholics in my word to come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. I don't want to burn in hell. Can I receive Jesus and reject the Catholic system now? No, it's too late for you, John. Only those who are still living can do that. You're claiming the church is the whore of Babylon in this verse. Since the whole verse was taken from a, uh, a chapter talking about Babylon, a man by the name of Dave Hunt in his 1994 book, um, A Woman Rides the Beast, presents nine arguments to try and prove this. Though you present no arguments of saying that the Catholic Church is a whore by blind, so if I have no arguments, I can't debate it, or I can't um, stop it, or I can't prove it wrong. So there it really isn't much I can say about this segment, so let's just continue on. If you have anything to say about it, put it in the comments below. Also, I forgot to add, um, if you want to hear more about the Horror of Babylon and what that dude said and then the Catholics' objection to it, it will be in the description. The first article will be the points the book author did, and the second author will be a Catholic apologetics uh, objections to it. Alright, now let us carry on. Yes, John is now reaping the rewards of serving the one true church. And I'm sure he can't wait for us all to join him. Don't end up like John. Trust Christ alone for your salvation. Lord Jesus, please forgive me for trusting a religion instead of you. I receive you as my personal savior, and I accept your gift of eternal life. If you have questions about the Catholic Church, leave them in the comments. If you have questions about the faith or about anyone, go to a priest, look it up online. I've given articles to websites that are great and you can use that, have, that can answer your questions. Don't go to a non-Catholic, because they will not give you the truth about the Catholic Church, as we saw in this video. Oh, and Catholics do accept Christ as their savior, and they do trust in God. So, don't see your point in that segment. Though, if you do have any questions about the Catholic Church or the Catholic faith, go to Catholics about it. Ask them the question, because they'll give you the truth about the Catholic Church. Not some non-Catholic who just wants to deceive and lie about our faith. Go to a priest, look it up. You can also leave questions in the comment section below. Just don't go to a non-Catholic if you have questions about Catholics. The Bible says there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Nobody else can save you. Admit you are a sinner. Be willing to turn from sin. Repent. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and rose from the dead. Through prayer, invite Jesus into your heart to become your personal savior. What to pray? Dear God, thank you for showing me what you think about Catholicism. I also reject it. I accept Christ's sacrifice as perfect and complete. Please forgive me in Jesus' name. I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life and I place my trust in him alone for my salvation. Thank you for giving me eternal life right now. If you just accept- First off, this isn't what God thinks about the Roman Catholic Church, it's what you think about the Roman Catholic Church. And Catholics do accept Jesus as our savior. I'll leave you guys to your thoughts. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Uh, if you have anything to say at all, feel free to leave them in the comments. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more, feel free to click that subscribe button so you can see when I upload. If you really enjoyed the video, feel free to give it a like. And I'll just see you guys next video. Uh, if I missed anything, though, tell me in the comments. But anyway, peace, guys. Oh, and God bless.